Uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Thune and Senator Schatz. <clears throat> um, everything you said, I, it's sad to me because it's happening not by accident but by design. Um, because the business model is to keep people engaged, which in other words, uh, this hearing is about persuasive technology. And persuasion is about an invisible asymmetry of power. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a magician. And magic teaches you that uh, you, know, you can have asymmetric power without the other person realizing it. You can masquerade uh, to have asymmetric power while, while looking like you have an equal relationship. You say, pick a card, any card. While meanwhile, you know exactly how to get that person to pick the card that you want. And essentially, what we're experiencing with technology is an increasing asymmetry of power that's been masquerading itself as a equal or contractual relationship where the responsibility is on us. So let's walk through why that's happening. In the race for attention, because there's only so much attention, companies have to get uh, more of it by being more and more aggressive. I call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem. So it starts with techniques like pull to refresh. So you pull to refresh your newsfeed. That operates like a slot machine. It has the same kind of addictive qualities that keep uh, people in Las Vegas hooked uh, to the slot machine. Other examples are uh, removing stopping cues. So if I take the bottom out of this glass uh, and I keep refilling the water or the wine, you won't know when to stop drinking. Uh, so that's what happens with infinitely scrolling feeds. We naturally remove the stopping cues, and this is what keeps people scrolling. But the race for attention has to get more and more aggressive. And so it's not enough just to get your behavior and predict what will take your behavior. We have to predict how to keep you hooked in a different way. And so it crawled deeper down the brainstem into our social validation. So that was the introduction of likes and followers. How many followers do I have? And that got every, it was much cheaper to, instead of getting your attention, to get you addicted to getting attention from other people. And this has created the kind of mass narcissism and mass cultural thing that's happening with, with young people, especially today. And after two decades in decline, um, the mental health of 10 to 14 year old uh, girls has actually shot up 170% in the last eight years. And this has been very characteristically uh, the cause of, of social media. And in the race for attention, it's not enough just to get people addicted to attention. The, the race has to migrate to AI. To who can build a better predictive model of your behavior? And so if you give an example of YouTube. So there you are. You're about to hit play in a YouTube video. And you hit play. And then you think you're going to watch this one video. And then you wake up two hours later and say, oh my god, what just happened? And the answer is because you had a supercomputer pointed at your brain. And at the moment you hit play, it wakes up an avatar voodoo doll-like version of you inside of a Google server. And that avatar based on all the clicks and likes and everything you've ever made, those are like your hair clippings and toenail clippings and nail filings that make the avatar look and act more and more like you. So that inside of a Google server, they can simulate more and more uh, possibilities. If I prick you with this video, if I prick you with this video, how long would you stay? And the business model is simply what maximizes watch time. This leads to the kind of algorithmic extremism that you've pointed out. Uh, and this is what's caused 70% of YouTube's traffic now to be driven by recommendations, not by human choice but by the machines. And it's a race between Facebook's uh, voodoo doll, where you flick your finger, can they predict what to show you next, and Google's voodoo doll. And these are abstract metaphors that apply to the whole tech industry, where it's a race between who can better predict your behavior. Facebook has something called loyalty prediction, where they can actually predict to a, an advertiser when you're about to become disloyal to a brand. So if you're a mother and you, you take Pampers diapers, uh, they can tell Pampers, hey, this user is about to become disloyal to this brand. So in other words, they can predict things about us that we don't know about our own selves. And that's a new level of asymmetric power. And we have a name for this asymmetric relationship, which is a fiduciary relationship or a duty of care relationship, the same standard we apply to, to doctors, to priests, to, to lawyers. Imagine a world in which priests only make their money by selling access to the confession booth to someone else. Except in this case, Facebook listens to two billion people's confessions, has a, has a supercomputer next to them, and is calculating and predicting confessions you're going to make before you know you're going to make them. And that's what's causing all this havoc. So I'd love to talk about more of these things later. I just want to finish up by saying this affects everyone, even if you don't use these products. Uh, you still send your kids to a school where other people believing that anti-vaccine conspiracy theories causes impact for your life or other people voting in your elections. And when Mark Andreessen said um, at the, you know, uh, in 2011 that the quote was, software is going to eat the world. And what he meant by that, Mark Andreessen was the founder of Netscape. What he meant by that was that software can do every part of society more efficiently than non-software, right? Because it's just adding efficiencies. And so we're going to allow software to eat up our elections. We're going to allow it to eat up our media, our taxi, our transportation. 
And the problem was that software was eating the world without taking responsibility for it. We used to have rules and standards around Saturday morning cartoons, and when YouTube gobbles up that part of society, it just takes away all of those protections. And I just wanna finish up by saying that I know Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers testified before this committee 50 years ago, concerned about the animated bombardment that we were showing children. I think he would be horrified today about what we're doing now. And at that same time, he was able to talk to the committee and that committee made a choice uh, differently. So I'm hoping we can talk more about that today. Thank you. Uh, we know that internet platforms like Google and Facebook have vast quantities of data about each user. What can these companies predict about users based on that data? Thank you for the question. Um, so I think there's, there's an con important connection to make between privacy and persuasion that I think often isn't linked, so maybe it's helpful to link that. Um, you know, with Cambridge Analytica, that was a, uh, a, an event in which, based on your Facebook likes, based on 150 of your Facebook likes, I could predict your political personality and then I could do things with that. What, the reason I open, described in my opening statement that this is about an increasing asymmetry of power is that without any of your data, I can predict increasing features about you using AI. Uh, there's a paper recently that with 80% accuracy, I can predict your same big five personality traits that Cambridge Analytica got from you. Without any of your data, all I have to do is look at your mouse movements and click patterns. So in other words, it's the end of the poker face. Your behavior is your signature, and we can know your political personality. Based on tweet text alone, we can actually know your political affiliation with about 80% accuracy. Computers can calculate probably that you're homosexual before you might know that you're homosexual. Uh, they can uh, predict with 95% accuracy that you're gonna quit your job according to an IBM study. Uh, they can predict that you're pregnant. They can predict your microexpressions on your face better than a human being can. Microexpressions are your um, your soft like reactions to to things that you're not that are not very visible but are invisibly visible. Computers can predict that. As you keep going and you realize that you can start to deep fake things, you can actually generate a new synthetic piece of media, a new synthetic face or synthetic message that is perfectly tuned to these characteristics. And the reason why I open the statement by saying we have to recognize that what this is all about is a growing asymmetry of power between technology and the limits of the human mind. Um, my favorite uh, sociobiologist, E.O. Wilson, said the fundamental problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic ancient emotions we have medieval institutions, and we have godlike technology. So we're chimpanzees with nukes, and our paleolithic uh, uh, brains are limited against uh, uh, the, the increasing exponential power of technology at predicting things about us. The reason why it's so important to migrate this relationship from being extractive to get things out of you to being a fiduciary is you can't have asymmetric power that is specifically designed to extract things from you. Just like you can't have, again, lawyers or doctors whose entire business model is to take everything they learn and sell it to someone else. Um, except in this case, the level of things that we can predict about you is, is far greater than actually each of those fields combined when you actually add up all the data that assembles a more and more um, accurate voodoo doll of each of us. And there's two billion voodoo dolls, by the way. Uh, there's one for one out of every four people on Earth uh, with YouTubes and Facebook are more than two billion people. Mm -hmm. Stanford. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, fascinating uh, discussion. I um, like to address an issue that I think is of uh, profound importance uh, to our democratic republic. And that's the fact that uh, in order to have a vibrant democracy, you need to have uh, an exchange of ideas and an open platform. And certainly part of the promise uh, of the internet as it was first conceived was that we'd have this incredible universal commons where a wide range of ideas would be discussed and debated, it would be robust, and yet it seems as if we're not getting that. We're actually getting more and more siloed. Uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Wolfram, you mentioned how people could make choices and they could live in a bubble, but at least it would be their bubble that they get to live in. Uh, but that's what we're seeing throughout our society as polarization increases, more and more folks are reverting to tribal type behavior. Mr. Harris, you talked about our uh, medieval uh, institutions and, uh, and Stone Age uh, mines. Uh, tribalism was alive and well in, in the past, uh, and, and we're seeing uh, advances in technology in a lot of ways uh, bring us back into that kind of uh, tribal behavior. So my, my question is, uh, how, to what extent is this technology actually accelerating that, and is there a way out? Yes, Mr. Harris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I love this question. Um, the, 
there's a tendency to think here that this is just human nature. Now, that's just people are polarized, and this is just playing out. It's a mirror. It's holding up a mirror to society. But what it's really doing is it's an amplifier for the worst parts of us. So in the race to the bottom of the brainstem to get attention, uh, let's take an example like Twitter. I, it's calculating what is the thing that I can show you that will get, gets the most engagement. And it turns out that outrage, moral outrage, gets the most engagement. So it was found in a study that uh, for every word, word of moral outrage that you add to a tweet, it increases your retweet rate by 17%. So in other words, um, you know, the polarization of our society is actually part of the business model. Another example of this is that shorter, briefer things work better in an attention economy than long, complex, nuanced ideas that take a long time to talk about. And so that's why you get 140 characters dominating our social discourse. But reality and the most important topics to us are increasingly complex. While we can say increasingly simple things about them, that automatically creates polarization because you can't say something simple about something complicated and have everybody agree with you. People will, by definition, misinterpret and hate you for it. And then it's never been easier to retweet that and generate a mob that will come after you. And this has created a call out culture and uh, chilling effects and a whole bunch of other subsequent effects in polarization that are amplified by the fact that these platforms are rewarded to give you the most sensational stuff. Um, one last example of this is on YouTube. Um, let's say we, we actually equalize, I know there's people here concerned about uh, equal representation on the left and the right in media. Let's say we get that perfectly right. As recently as just a month ago on YouTube, if you did a map of the top 15 most frequently mentioned verbs or keywords in the recommended videos, they were hates, debunks, obliterates, destroys. In other words, you know, Jordan Peterson destroys social justice warrior in video. So that kind of thing is the background radiation that we're dosing two billion people with. And you can hire content moderators in English and start to handle the problem is, as Ms. Stamphill said, but the problem is that two billion people in hundred, you know, hundreds of languages are using these products. How many engineers at YouTube speak the 22 languages of India where there's an election coming up? So that's some context on that. Well, there's, there's a lot of context. Fascinating. And I'm running out of time, but I, I took particular note uh, in your testimony when you talked uh, about how technology will eat up elections. Uh, and you were referencing, I think, another uh, uh, writer on that issue. Uh, in the remaining brief time I have. What's your biggest concern about the 2020 elections and how technology may eat up this election coming up? Um, yeah, that comment was that another example of we used to have protections that technology took away. We used to have equal price campaign ads so that it cost the same amount on a Tuesday night at 7 p.m. for any candidate to run an election. When Facebook gobbles up that part of media, it just takes away those protections. So there's now no equal pricing. Um, what, in terms of what I'm worried about, I'm mostly worried about the fact that none of these problems have been solved. Um, the business model hasn't changed, and the reason why you see a Christchurch event happen and the video just show up everywhere, or you know, any of this, these examples, fundamentally there's no easy way for these platforms to uh, address this problem because the problem is their business model. Thank you, Senator. Yes, this is one of the issues that most concerns me. Um, as I think uh, Senator Schatz mentioned at the beginning, there's evidence that uh, in the last month even, as recently as that, keeping in mind that these issues have been reported on for years now, uh, there was an, a pattern identified by YouTube that uh, young girls who had uh, taken videos of themselves dancing in front of cameras were linked in usage patterns to other videos like that that, it, that went further and further into that realm. And that was just identified by YouTube you know, as a supercomputer as a pattern. It's a pattern of this is a kind of pathway that tends to be highly engaging. The way that we tend to describe this, if you imagine a spectrum on YouTube, on my left side there's the calm Walter Cronkite section of YouTube. On the right hand side there's crazy town. UFOs, conspiracy theories, Bigfoot, uh, you know, whatever. And um, if you take a human being, and you're, you could drop them anywhere. You could drop them in the calm section, or you could drop them in crazy town. But if I'm YouTube and I want you to watch more, which direction from there am I going to send you? I'm never going to send you to the calm section. I'm always going to send you towards crazy town. So now you imagine two billion people, like an ant colony of humanity, and it's tilting the playing field towards the crazy stuff. And the uh, specific examples of this, a year ago, uh, a teen girl who looked at a dieting video on YouTube would be recommended anorexia videos. Uh, because that was the more extreme thing to show the voodoo doll that looked like a teen girl. There's all these voodoo dolls that look like that, and the next thing to show is, is uh, anorexia. Uh, if you looked at a NASA moon landing, it would show flat earth conspiracy theories, which it recommended hundreds of millions of times. 
uh, before take, being taken down recently. Um, I wrote down another example. 50% uh, of white nationalists in a Bellingcat study had said that it was YouTube that had red-pilled them. Red-pilling is the term for you know, the opening of the mind. Um, the best predictor of whether you'll believe in a conspiracy theory is whether I can get you to believe in one conspiracy theory. Because one conspiracy sort of opens up the mind and makes you doubt and question things and say that, get really paranoid. And the problem is that YouTube is doing this in mass and it's created sort of two billion personalized Truman shows. Right? Each channel has that radicalizing direction. And if you think about it from an accountability perspective, back when we had Janet Jackson on one side of the TV screen at the Super Bowl and we had 60 million Americans on the other, we had a five second TV delay and a bunch of humans in the loop it, for a reason. But what happens when you have two billion Truman shows, two billion possible Janet Jacksons, and two billion people on the other end? It, it's a digital Frankenstein that, that's really hard to control. And so that's, I think, the way that we need to see it. From, from there, we can talk about how to regulate it. Yeah. Of course. Anyone else have a thought on that pretty important threshold question? Yeah, I think so. Mr. Get, Harris. Oh, if it's okay if I jump yeah, in. Sure. Thank you, Senator. Um, the uh, issue here is that Section 230 of the Communications yeah, Decency Act. It's all Act about Section 230. It's all about Section 230. Uh, has obviously made it so that the platforms are not responsible for any content that is on them, which freed them up to do what we've created today. Um, the problem is if you. You know, is YouTube a, a publisher? Well, they're not generating the content, they're not paying journalists, they're not doing that, but they are recommending things. And I think that we need a new class um, between, you know, the New York Times is responsible if they say something that defames someone else, that reaches a certain hundred million or so people. Uh, when YouTube recommends flat earth conspiracy theories hundreds of millions of times, and if you consider that 70% of YouTube's traffic is driven by recommendations, meaning driven by what they are recommending, what an algorithm is choosing to put in front of the eyeballs of a person. It's, if you were to backwards derive a motto, it would be with great power comes no responsibility.